Thank you, Lord. You know, there are so many things that are going on today in the world. There's so much happening in so many places that uh, it's hard to kind of hone down to exactly what we should share and what we should talk about. But uh, some of the things that the Holy Spirit has put upon my heart uh, to release today to you, I believe, are things that will help establish us in a, in a lot of ways for the days that are coming. Because the days uh, ahead, uh, you know, if, if we listen to those who are, have some knowledge in the world and of how our government, government is being manipulated, uh, we can know that there are things happening today that uh, will steer us away from the traditions of the past. And also, if we listen to the Holy Spirit, if we're hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying, then I, I believe he's giving us warnings, uh, giving us time actually to prepare for the days ahead. Uh, he's, uh, I believe that even as the, as the Lord Jesus Christ walked upon this earth, he spoke of our day that we're living in today, and he's, he's given us insights on how to prepare for the days ahead. But one of the ways, the most significant way to prepare for the days ahead is to be transformed into the image of Jesus. No matter what uh, message he wants to get, get, wants to get across to us, that message of being transformed into the image of Jesus is key in everything. But there's some practical things that we need to also look at in order to be prepared for the days ahead. Uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back for a very, very powerful church. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a church that is powerful, a church that is doing everything that is designed to do, a church that is demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit to a lost and dying world. I believe that with all my heart. I believe he's coming back for not a, a whimpering church, not a church that's, that's holding back, not a church that's hiding from the things of this world, but a church that is powerful. And in order to, for us to be that church, there's some things that we need to make sure that we are addressing properly so we are, are open for the blessings of God. And we're going to review a little bit of that, what I spoke about last week in a few minutes. But there's things that we must uh, keep in mind in order to be prepared for the days ahead. You know, in the book of Haggai, the, the prophet well, the Lord by the, spoke through the prophet Haggai. He said, the silver is mine, then the gold is mine, says the Lord. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. And then he goes on to say, and he says, the glory of the, this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In this place, I will give peace, says the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I believe that the Lord is talking there about, uh, at least to some degree, about the latter day temple of the Lord. And the latter day temple of the Lord is not... A building of bricks and stones it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit we are the temple of God on earth today and so he's bringing a a glorious church uh, to uh, to finish off what he began what Jesus began he's he's preparing us to demonstrate the glory of God upon the earth and if the church isn't demonstrating the glory of God upon the earth, then the glory of God will not be demonstrated upon the earth. We're the hope of the, the, of the world seeing the glory of God because he lives on the inside of us. And so we walk in obedience, as we walk in obedience to him, then we open ourselves up to be able to be that person that's able to bring glory to the Father. Now, uh, and again, I say we are looking for Preparation for the days ahead. And in Isaiah chapter 1, it says, Come now, let us reason together. The Lord says this to the people of Israel. Come now, let us reason together. In other words, he's trying to convince the people. He wants to talk to them. He says, Come on, let's sit down now. Let's reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If, everybody say if. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. And if you refuse and rebel, then you will be devoured by the sword. But the key there, if you are willing, you will eat the good of the land. If you are willing and obedient. 
not only willing, but also obedient. There has to be a willingness and to be obedient to the Word of God. And so God is laying out a formula for us to eat the good of the land, a formula for us to walk in, in prosperity in many, many ways. And then he talks about if you're willing and obedient, and he's saying obedient to what? And if we look over at the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi there, the prophet Malachi really prophesied to a people who were rebellious against God. They were bringing all kinds of, of uh, lame and, and beaten up and wounded and sick sacrifices to the Lord. And they were doing, they, they were bringing things that they were supposed to bring fat sacrifices, but they weren't bringing their best the way they were supposed to. They were bringing uh, the, the lame and so forth. And actually the prophet at one point says, God through the prophet says, try doing that to your government, governor. Try to bring the, bringing the lame and the sick to your gov governor and see if that'll work out for you. But here I am, your God, your father, and you're bringing me this. And then he goes on to say about your tithes and offerings. You're not bringing them. And, and he goes on to say in, in Malachi verse, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. In other words, he's saying, if you don't bring your tithes and offerings before the Lord, then you're actually robbing God. I mean, it's one thing to rob your neighbor. It's one thing to, in one sense, to try to rob your governor. But boy, it's something to rob God. That's a different, you're in a different realm altogether. And he says that you do it by, when you don't bring tithes and offerings. And he says, because... The people of Israel then were not bringing their tithes and offerings. He says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. And then he goes on to say, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that you will not be able to, you will not have room to receive it. And then he says this, he says, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. I will rebuke the enemy. I mean, this is the only place in the Bible where uh, I, I can read where it, got, where it says that God is going to rebuke the devourer on our behalf. And we get over into the, the New Testament and Jesus, uh, the Bible says that God has given us, Jesus has given us power, authority over all the works of the devil. But here, if we do this, the Bible says that God himself will rebuke, rebuke the devourer on our behalf. Glory to God. I mean, we've got somebody on our side. We know when, whenever we're having a difficult time, we're saying, we, we should be able to say, Lord, I'm a, I'm a tither, Lord. I'm not cheating you in this. I'm not robbing you. You said you'd re rebuke the devourer on my behalf. If things aren't, aren't going right, check it out. Check out, see how you're doing in that area. And believe God for his grace and mercy to come upon you because you said, if you are willing and obedient, if you're willing and obedient to the word of the Lord. And as the Lord is speaking today, he, he expects us to be obedient to him. He, if we will follow his plan, we will uh, reap the benefits of walking in righteousness. Psalm uh, 100, pardon me, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that bears his fruit in season. His leaf also does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Hallelujah. Whatever he does prospers. So when we walk in the ways of the Lord, when we meditate on the things of God, when we meditate on the word of God, God is saying, do these things because days are coming that you're going to need an intervention of the Lord's blessing into your life in order even to survive. And that, well, that, that's actually an encouraging word. And as we, as we go on this morning, we'll, we'll see that. As I was praying recently, asking the Lord for what's his word for our congregation, uh, <coughs> he gave me this word that I believe uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you, and, and it, it encouraged me. And maybe it'll encourage you too. But even as I was, uh, I was praying and meditating on this, this is what the, the Lord spoke to me. He said, the door I open for you are doors of life. This is contrary to the doors that lead to darkness. For the doors that lead to darkness are death and misery. 
I have ordained for you to walk in life, the life that comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus died your death that, might, that life might prevail in your being. The life of God is true life, for true life only comes through Jesus. It is his life that flows through every believer, and it is his life that sustains every believer. The purposes of God in the life of the believer will be fulfilled as attention is given to my word and my spirit. In the days coming, there will be times of distress upon the earth, but my people need not be in distress, for I am, I am their health, especially in time of trouble. The lies that the enemy tempts the world and my people with are only a facade. They only have power when people believe their lies. My word will give discernment that is needed in these days. As you take hold of my word in order to gain discernment, I will make up for any shortfall you may have in discerning right from wrong. Well, that's encouraging to me. The word of the Lord is encouraging to me. He lets me know that in times of trouble, he's not going to let us down. In times of trouble, he will be there because he has actually administered his, his life into us, into each and every one of us. We're not just everyday people on this earth. We're different. Why? Because the life of God dwells in each and every one of us. We're not talking about the world here. We're talking about the life of God that dwells in each and every one of us. And that life of God that dwells in our spirits, in our born-again spirit, wants to influence our, our mind, will, and emotions. It wants to uh, influence every part of our being. God's live life in us brings us to a place of victory in a, in a world that is going in the opposite direction. But we don't have to follow the world. We have a better way. God is showing us a better way. Now, there's some things that I mentioned. Actually, it was two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, I talked about closing doors for the enemy so the enemy wouldn't have any, any hold upon us, that we would cut off anything that the enemy is trying to use in order to get an entranceway into our lives. We want to become like Jesus when Jesus said that the, the God of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. There's nothing in Jesus. There was nothing in him that the enemy could tap and say, That's, I developed that in that. I put that in, that in him. No, there was none of that in Jesus. And we, are, we want to be conformed to the image of Jesus, and we want to be in the same way so the enemy doesn't have a foothold in our lives. And we mentioned a number of things concerning closing the doors. But just one that I want to mention uh, of those doors that need to be closed is, the, is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, where it says, Be angry without sinning. Do not go to bed angry. Don't give the devil an opportunity to work. Do not give the devil a foothold is what's really saying here. And so one of the ways that the enemy tries to get into our lives, get a foothold into our lives, is through anger. And there are a lot of angry people walking around today. There's a lot of people who get angry over anything. They're actually looking for a cause to be able to demonstrate their anger. And the, the, the Bible says here that we are to be angry and sin not because giving, being angry will give the devil an open door, a foothold into our lives. And if we give him a foothold into our lives, he will cause havoc one way or the other. And one of the ways... Uh, what's, what's deceptive about the enemy is that he will cause, uh, he will get a foothold in our lives in a particular air, area. We may even say that, yeah, we know we've got a problem with anger. There's some people, you know, they go through ma anger management. They try to manage their anger. They try to, you, you can't manage a, a demon spirit. You got to cast it out. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't manage something that the enemy is, try is manipulating in your life. And the, uh, the, the thing about the deceptiveness about the enemy is that when he gets a hold in your life in a particular area, if it's an area of anger, then uh, you know you're dealing with that anger, and, but you also may have some physical problems. And you, uh, most people don't identify or, or connect the dots between the spirit of anger and your physical problem. And so it's so important for us to make sure that we close the door to any door pathway for the enemy to be able to come in because he will manifest himself not only in a demonstration of what that spirit is, like a spirit of anger, but also bring uh, 
physical problems in your body as well many, many times. It's a big deal. We must close the door to the enemy. Now, uh, I also want, last week I talked about opening doors to become Christ-like, opening doors for blessing, o- opening doors to, to, for us to be able to give an en- invitation to the Holy Spirit to come in and to move upon our lives. We'll, we'll just go through them really quick. The, the uh, first one I mentioned was honor, honor your father and mother. We talked about that. Uh, last week about the importance of honoring your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise that things might go well with you and that you might live long on the earth. So it's important for us to make sure that we honor our parents. Another one we said praise and thanksgiving, lifting up hands in worship, giving thanks to Almighty God, uh, coming into communion with God through our our praise and worship. That opens a door for influence of the Holy Spirit. The third one we talked about was humility. We talked about how important it is to make sure that there's no pride in our lives. Make sure that the thing that got the devil kicked out of heaven is not functioning in our lives. Make sure that we're not allowing pride to dictate what we do. That we don't get so puffed up that we think we're something greater than we are. That we are putting ourselves above everybody else. No, pride is a killer. And it'll keep the blessing of God from our lives. The fourth one we mentioned was... Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about a one-time infilling. I'm talking about every day we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And actually, in in number five, uh, the the Bible tells us to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5, 19, it says, The way to do that is speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's one way that we can stay filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be proactive in being filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be a people who are, you know, if we're feeling down a particular day, we say, well, I better get filled up with the Holy Spirit and begin to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Maybe it's just you there. It doesn't matter what you sound like. You can just sing and and praise the Lord and worship Him, make a connection that way. That opens the door to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And don't forget to give thanks to the Lord in all of that. Number six, refuse to be offended. That is a big one. Absolutely refuse to take any offense. Never be a people people who is offended because of your stand in faith, because of what Holy Spirit is doing in your life. You might take criticism. Just refuse to be offended by that criticism. Just let it roll off of you like water off a duck's back. Don't let it go in there at all. After all, God sees what's going on, and and Jesus said that you'll be blessed if you're offended and persecuted for his name's sake. Number seven, be skilled in the word of righteousness so that you might have godly discernment. Be skilled in the word of righteousness. In other words, know that you have right standing with God. Know that God's righteousness has been imparted to you. Know that you don't have to go around walking in this world as a, as a poor old sinner who, who, doesn't, who can't enter into the presence of God. Know that you have right standing with him because Jesus gave up the, us the gift of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that amazing? We get to call ourselves righteous before God because of what Jesus did for us. Glory to God. Uh, whenever I think of that, I just fall on my face at the time thanking Jesus for what he's done. It's amazing. We'll be wondering about that throughout e- eternity. Uh, number eight, express today the inexpressible joy that awaits us in eternity. Express today that inexpressible joy God gave, gives us a reason to be joyful every single day. And that will help us stay filled with the Holy Spirit as well. To be so joyful about the things of God and about where we are headed. In Psalm 51 it says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Well, if we are if we're feeling bad about a particular day, talk about, think about the fact that you got saved. 
You, God came upon your life. Even when you were lost and you were an enemy from God, of God, God came in and saved you and brought you into the kingdom of God. God you brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his beloved son. Glory to God. You don't have to die and go to hell. You're looking for eternity in heaven. Glory to God. And if you can't be, you be excited about that, then you need one of those cattle prods to prod you once in a while to get some excitement because... We, we get, get excited about our salvation, the joy of our salvation. Glory to Jesus. And so that's a, that's a number of the things that we talked about, about opening the door to the blessing of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. And we want to continue to do that. We want to always, always uh, rejoice in the things that the Lord has, has accomplished for us. Now, I, I want to also say that here we are living as aliens in the foreign land. We're kingdom of God citizens living in the world. And there are things that happen in a foreign land that are not meant to happen in the kingdom of God, in the, in the land that we belong to. And we want to, uh, and there's some things that we want to, we need to aim for while we are here. And one of the things that have gotten into the body of Christ that I believe that uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's going to have to be a shift take place in order for Jesus to come back for that pure and spotless bride. Because from what I see for the most part, in North America here I'm talking about, that we have this idea that our chief goal a lot of times is happiness. Our, our chief goal is how comfortable we can get through this life. Our chief goal is you know, what, what problems I can get away from. Uh, how easily I can come I I through this life and then finally make it to heaven. And that's the very attitude that, that got a lot of uh, nations in the world in the last century into a state of, of communism, into, into a state of being ruled by authoritarians and by tyranny. That's the attitude that, uh, that g slides people into a, a position of being dominated. And in the kingdom of God, we have to make sure that happiness is not our chief aim, our chief goal. It should never be our chief goal. That is not the greatest virtue in the world nor in the, in the kingdom of God. And uh, you might say, well, what is the greatest? Well, I believe the greatest aim that we should be focused on, the greatest goal that we should have is a desire to be transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that won't come with all happiness and joy. There'll be some difficult times that we have to go through in the midst of it. But I believe it's, it's worth it. Aim for transformation. Be a courageous people about being transformed. Be a courageous individual in this, in this land that we live in. Courageous people make an impact. Courageous people, are, they, they make an influence in society. They can actually shift society a lot of times. Things can take place that uh, will, will shift a, a, small, a small group of courageous people can shift the tide, if you will, in such a way that where we're going away from God, we can turn back to God. Courageous people make an influence in life. And there are courageous, lots of courageous uh, groups in the world that are taking place. Uh, whether you agree with them or, or not, the uh, Canadian uh, frontline nurses are meeting down to the Cenotaph today at 4 o'clock, and they're a courageous group about their, about their cause. You know, whether you're, uh, you know, in agreement with it or not, you've got to admit they're courageous. They go forth and across the land. They're not doing anything other than trying to make a difference in our society. And we have to be courageous about, about who we are in Christ. We have to be courageous about... The fact that we are to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And as I say, that won't always come lightly. You know, in Joshua 1.9, uh, God told Joshua, Have I not commanded you to be courageous, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He gave that encouragement to Joshua because he was going into battle. Now, he, did, he wasn't telling him that he wasn't going to have a battle. He wasn't telling him that he wasn't going to have a difficult time. He wasn't telling him that he was going to live in peace and joy and comfort all of his life. He said, but I will be with you. But in the midst of it, be courageous because I will be with you. That's the message he gave to Joshua. I believe that's the message he wants us to 
the, uh, the hold close to us today. And the early church had some kind of understanding about that because when they got together, one of the things that they prayed about was that they might have boldness, that the Lord would grant them a spirit of boldness that they might speak the word of God with all boldness and that God would stretch forth his hand to heal and signs and wonders take place in the name of Jesus. You know, I believe the more courageous we are, the more we'll see the hand of God move in our midst more courageous we are about speaking to others about what Jesus has done in our lives and their need for Jesus, I believe that will open the door as well for the moving of the Holy Spirit to come in such a powerful way and pick the fruit that are ripe out there. Glory to God. Courageous people make a difference. The word courage actually from the dictionary actually means to the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, and pain without fear. Bravery is another word. To be courageous is, is not that you're not going to face pain or, or discouragement or all those kind of things, but courageous people face it and they run through it. Whether they fear or not, there's, they, they still run. You know, you, even if there's a spirit of fear trying to hold you back, you can still do it in fear if you have to and be a courageous individual. Now, one of the things that I say we want to be courageous about our transformation process. Because God wants to take us from glory to glory. Every time we go further in the journey of our transformation, we are going to another level of glory. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. The Apostle Paul writes, but we all, that's us too, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we are actually being transformed from glory to glory. So no matter how great an experience you ever had with the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how great a spiritual experience you ever had, God wants you to take you to another level of glory. God wants to take you farther into his, his glorious plan that he has for you. He doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to be conformed to the image of Jesus. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Now do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Now, the Apostle Paul wouldn't have wrote that if there wasn't a possibility of the church being conformed to the world. He knew that there was the world system with doing everything it, it can in order to conform God's people to the world system. But he says we are not to be conformed by that. He's got another plan, another purpose. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we can be transformed. How do we renew our mind? We renew our mind with the word of God. We are newer, renew our mind with prayer. We renew our mind also with worship. And you say, well, how could worship re renew our mind? When we worship the Lord, His presence comes. And every time the presence of the Lord comes, I'm telling you, it affects your spirit, soul, and body. It affects, affects every part of our emotions. The presence of the Lord influences our emotions so that we'll come to be a person who, that will quickly shun the evil and run to the good. Being transformed. What a glorious experience. So God never called you out for the purpose of happiness. He called you out for adventure. Adventure into the things of the kingdom of God. He called you into a, an adventure that will advance the kingdom of God and display God's kingdom on the earth. When God called Abraham out, he called, Abraham was comfortable where he was and called him out into a land. He said, I'll take you to a land that I'll show you. And he said he would be with them. He called them out, and he prospered Abraham in many, many ways. But Abraham went through some very difficult trials and struggles as well. He, he went through some difficult battles that he had to go through. He went through some tests and trials that were maybe many of us would fail today. But he called him out into adventure. He called Joshua and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and then into an adventure experience while taking the land of Canaan. But there was a lot of difficulty. There was a lot of trial. He called them out of that. Well, God has called us out of the world as well. And as he called us out of the world, we realize that we are called to adventure, not necessarily to happiness. 
I know one thing, my, my life has been so much better, so much more joy, so much more happiness since I came to Christ, but that's not the reason he called me out. He called me out to a higher standard, he called me out to, a, to, a, a, to be an individual that would enhance the kingdom of God and do what we can to advance the kingdom of God, to live before him, to be transformed into his image. There's an interesting scripture in, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22. The Apostle Paul uh, is meeting with a group of leaders from different, uh, different cities and di different uh, Christian leaders. And the Bible says that he was strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now, he, he's saying... I'm strengthening you by telling you this. We must, through many trials and tribulations, there'll be difficult times, enter the kingdom of God in this way. In other, in other words, advance the kingdom of God in this way. It won't be all a bed of roses. It won't be all times of wonderful joy and happiness and comfort. But it will be a time of adventure. It will be a time of doing the Lord's will. After all, God calls Saul out of darkness into the light. And if we know anything about Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, it wasn't all joy. It wasn't all, uh, I shouldn't say it wasn't all joy. It may have been joy in the Lord, but he went through much trial and tribulation and difficulty and, and pain and all the rest of it. But he got the job done, glory to God. And he wants us to get the job done as well. He wants us to be courageous about being transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be a people who are willing to let go of the things that are holding us back, things that are keeping us from being held back from God's best, let's put it that way. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote this through many tribulations and, and so forth, he, that we would come into the kingdom of God with great difficulty, he wanted us to understand that persecution should not be a strange thing to the Christian. Persecution should not be awed to the Christian. That persecutions will come. Jesus said that, but he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's the one we hold our, our hope and faith in. We must learn, one of the main things that we have to learn being conformed into the image of Jesus is overcome me. We have to say there's someone that we have to overcome. We have to take our finger and point it and turn it around to us. We have to overcome me. There's a lot of things that are happening in the world. There's a lot of things that we don't agree with. There's a lot of confusion in the world today. Confusion that it was unimaginable even a few decades, decades ago. Uh, people who don't know whether they're a girl or a boy. Don't know the, you don't know whether you, what name you should call them. This whole transgender confusion, this acceptance of, of uh, marriage between a man and a man, and all these kinds of things. There is so much confusion out there. And we can point the finger out to them. And we can be right in the way we think and in, in the way we think about those things. And I'm not concerned necessarily about the way I think about those things and whether I'm even right or wrong. What I'm concerned about is my attitude in my thinking, my attitude in how I think about those things. Because the Bible says the world looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And if my, I can be right in my doctrine, I can be right in the way things should be done and wrong in my attitude and still be wrong if I want to be courageous about being conformed into the image of Jesus. And God wants, to, God wants us always to check our hearts. And we have to stop and think, can you find, if you have a mean attitude toward anybody, a, need, a mean attitude, uh, and because things get you annoyed and angry and you can't understand other people and all the rest of it, if you have any kind of that, stop and think, can I find anywhere in the Gospels, can I find anything in the life of Jesus that displays this kind of attitude? And if we can't find it, then we have to say, God, change me. Change me, change me, change me. 
Help me take on the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ in this confusing world that we live in. Help me take on the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. If my attitude is not right, pointing my finger at other people who are living right, or pardon me, living in an abomination, let's say, if my attitude is not right, I become like the Pharisees in John chapter 8 that were more concerned about the stoning the woman who was caught in adultery than their own sin. If my attitude isn't correct. Amen, Pastor Bill. I better move on. <laughs> Philippians 2.14 do all things without complaining. That's a big one. Do all things without complaining. That means when it gets up in a rainy day and you're planning to do something outside, don't be complaining about the weather. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Another way of saying is arguing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among you shine as lights in the world. Wow. Do things without complaining, without argument, so that you might be blameless and harmless children of God in this perverted, crooked generation, generation that we live in. That's an exhortation from the word of the Lord. It gives us a glimpse of how we are to live in this generation that we live in. Do all things without complaining, without disputing. And I've said before that one of the things when the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness, it seemed that above anything else that would really get the Lord's anger up was their murmuring. Their murmuring. They didn't have enough of this. They didn't have enough. They were tired of this. They wanted something new. How often we get into that situation. God help us. Well, we, are, we have a better way to live. We have a standard that is not of this world. We are to be a people to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Why? Because we are in covenant with him. We are in covenant with our heavenly father. What a glorious, glorious privilege we have to be in covenant relationship with him. Covenants in the Old Testament... All through the Old Testament, year after year, they would do a certain feasts and rituals in order to ratify the covenant for another year. And when we come into the kingdom of God, we are part of the new covenant that God has for you and I. And we have something to bring us uh, to, into remembrance of that covenant that, that, we are, that we have with him. And that covenant really speaks to us about having all of his blessing upon our lives and we give all our lives to him. That's really what covenant a relationship is all about. It's a relation, covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. To reach a common goal. Well, Jesus came. One of the last things he said was to go forth and preach the gospel to all the world, to every nation. And so this is our common goal that we are to be involved in as we are part of the new covenant that Jesus brought us into. And we're going to enter into that celebration of the covenant meal in a few minutes, and we want to prepare ourselves for this covenant meal because in, in a way it's, we're, we're doing a gain, we're experiencing a gain our commitment to Jesus. We're experiencing again his commitment to us because just like the prodigal, uh, the father of the prodigal son said to the elder brother, he looked at him and said, listen, all that I have is yours. All that I am is yours. God is saying that to us. All that I have, all that I am is yours. He's given us his very best and he demonstrated that by sending Jesus. Glory to God. He gave us the very best. We're about to partake <clears throat> in a blessing. And uh, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, it says this. 
The cup of blessing we bless. Thanks, your team, for coming up. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Think about this now. It is the communion, the uniting, uniting of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are partakers of one bread. We, are, we come together as a body of believers to celebrate communion together, to celebrate the covenant, to demonstrate before heaven that we are in covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father. Glory to God. So it's a privilege. And I believe reading in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when it talked about them breaking bread together, that they believed that there was a special presence of the Holy Spirit, of Jesus being with us at that time. There was a, a special communion of Jesus himself being amongst them. They were reliving again when Jesus at the Last Supper broke bread and gave it to his disciples. And that's what we do when we come to the communion table. We receive his blood, we receive his body. We are saying we are in covenant relationship with him. I want you to stand with me as we prepare.